and we're going to do a hollow cylinder, and you'll see why. Because we can take the results we got from the hollow cylinder and apply it uh, for uh, to get a ring and to get a, a solid cylinder or a disc. So let's erase and let's draw our cylinder. I'm going to leave these up there for, for reference in a little bit because I'm going to show you something when we get there. I'm going to leave that there. So my cylinder has got a hole down the middle of it. Here's what we'll look at here first. So here's my outside radius, which is going to be constant, which will be R2. Here's the middle. So this is going to be capital R2. And then I'm going to cut a hole down the middle of it. And it's going to be capital R1. So we'll think of this as a holy cylinder. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's the holy cylinder. There's my R1. Okay. And to make it look like a cylinder, we, we give it a 3D effect by saying, hey, there we go. There's my cylinder part of it. And then it's got a nice little rounded edge over here. And this is capital L, the length of the cylinder. Okay. And even uh, there's the hole down the middle of the cylinder. It goes in, so sort of like that. If you want to think of it that way. Well, the way that we do this is, uh, in this case, the total mass and the, we need the total volume for, for that. Uh, so when we have our three choices, lambda, sigma, and rho, like over here, remember we had the, the lambda, the sigma, and the rho? Uh, this time we're going to use the rho, and we're going to say the total mass of the cylinder divided by the total volume of the cylinder is a certain constant. Okay? So we use the rho, which is the mass of the volume. Well, how do I find the volume of that cylinder, this hollow? Total mass. How do I find the volume of a cylinder by itself? Well, it's, it's pi r squared L. Right? Pi r squared L. So if I say pi L times r2 squared minus r1 squared, that takes up the whole. Right? So I get pi r squared, r1 squared L, that's the pi r1 squared L, that's the whole volume. And the pi r2 squared L is the whole total volume of the big thing. So if I subtract those out, that's going to be how much volume of the, the net volume, if you want to think of it. Yeah. So total mass divided by total volume. Well, that's also equal to a little dm is about a little dv. Different total volume. Different total volume. Well, just like we did Gauss's law, we had a cylinder, we had the charge smeared throughout the whole thing. Well, we got the mass smeared throughout the whole thing. Nice and neat, okay? So we need to set us up a nice little cylinder inside. And this is where we use the capital R's, I believe, where the rays of the spheres and the cylinders and stuff we uh, did as you're quickly, so, so, so nice to point out a minute ago. But then we used our little r as the radius of the Gaussian surface. Well, so our little r here is going to be the radius of the cylindrical surface that we're going to have with, with that differential element of mass inside it. So I'm going to make a nice little circle here. It might look like like the, the shells kind of method that y'all talked about a little bit. Should we draw it a different color with the Gaussian? Yeah, we can do that. A good suggestion. Thank you. That's a pretty good suggestion there. So this little little part here. Did the green show pretty well while ago, I think? Uh, right there. Or how about the blue? I think the blue, I think the blue would be better. The blue shows the better problem. Green wasn't very good. We always use the blue. Let's see if it's a good blue one. While I'm looking, just want to check and see whether we got a good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, there we go. I think. <coughs> so I'm going to set up inside of the cylinder 
a, a thin, very thick shell, a cylindrical shell. That's radius R. It's got a thickness in here of dr, so I'm drawing in another circle here. But this this radius is essentially the same radius as what I just drew, because it's infinitesimally thick or infinitesimally thin. I guess you can think of it that way. So the thickness here is going to be dr. So if I have the total mass, if I have a total, oh. I forgot the little L's. My L's, and I got this direction for the cylinder that I'm, that I'm uh, creating here inside as well. I've got total mass over total volume. It's the same thing as dm over dv. What's that going to look like? I'll recopy here. If the volume of a cylinder is what? Pi R L. Pi R squared. Then what's going to be a different element of volume? 2 pi R dr L? Yeah. Right? So, then, so what I'm going to put here is my dv, which is going to be 2 pi R. L dr. So I'm thinking of this blue little cylinder inside there. I'll pull it out and I will snip it. I'm going to cut it and unfold it. Okay. So when I take that cylinder that I've set inside here and I clip it and I cut it, so here's my my blue paper thin shell dr thickness. So there's my blue thing here and I'm going to take it out. Then I'm going to cut, cut it, and I'm going to unfold it, right? So the, this distance from here to here would be called 2 pi r, that's the circumference. The L will be this distance here, and then the thickness will be my dr. So that's going to be a volume element, okay, a dv, which we drew right over there. So that dv is my 2 pi r L dr. And I go to my definition of moment of inertia and say, okay, moment of inertia by definition is integral of r squared dm. And I stick in for my dm. In this case, we're integrating from r1 to r2 because we have a holy cylinder, not just a solid cylinder, it's the holy one. And so for r squared, I'm going to keep an r squared there. But for my dm, I'm going to rearrange this for dm. And it's going to be rho times the dv there. So I'm going to put the rho in there, and then I'm putting the 2 pi r l dr. How does that sound? Yeah. Okay. It's okay? So there's my r squared dm, and my dm is rho times dv, and that's the dv right there. Now pull out all my constants. What are my constants? Rho, 2, pi, L. L. So I pull all that out. Rho, 2, pi, L. And I'm left with R cubed dr. So that way from R1 to R2. So going, coming down to the next line. That is raised to R before the four, right? Yep. So I get two pi rho L times R to the fourth over four. Evaluated from R one to R two. And I go ahead and take I see a two to four to get rid of that. And so that will come out to be one half. I still have my pi, and I still have my rho, but what is my rho going to be? Total mass over total volume, right. right? So my total mass is capital M, and my total volume is pi 
L times R2 squared times R1 squared. That front, this is my, my row, so there's my one half pi in my row. This front here is row. And I got to put the L there. And then I have R the fourth over four. Well, the upper limit will be R2 squared. How about to the fourth? Yeah, R2. R2 to the fourth. R2. <laughs> to minus R1 to the fourth. Okay? Mm -hmm. No, am I okay? I'm going to leave these down here because we're going to need them in a minute. Well, hopefully I can see the what? The M's, I'm oh, sorry, the pi's and the L's are gone. This pi here, that pi there, that, that L there, that L there. So that leaves me with one half M. And I get R2 to the 4th minus R1 to the 4th divided by R2 squared minus R1 squared. And then I notice this, oh, guess what? I see a difference of two squares. So think of this as A squared minus B squared, or A to the 4th minus B to the 4th. Yeah. What's that going to be? a squared plus b squared times a squared minus b squared. So this numerator, I mean the piece of here in the numerator will become r2 squared plus r1 squared times r2 squared minus r1 squared. And guess what? The r2 squared minus r1 squared will cancel. Okay? So that's the coolest thing that comes out. We get one half m. So for the numerator, I'm going to get r two squared plus R1 squared times R2 squared minus R1 squared all divided by R2 squared minus R1 squared and that whole thing cancels. So it's a little messy derivation that comes out in the last result. And then I said, if we do the, this is the hard one. What can we say? What if it was, this is hollow cylinder. I could write that up there, hollow cylinder. What if I want to make it solid? Well, change the limits of integration, right? Instead of going from R1 to R2, let R1 go to zero. Okay? So R1 going to zero will mean I'll change the limits of integration to zero to R. Right? So in that case, if R1 goes to zero, what happens here? I get one half in R squared. R2 squared, or R. Right? So let's just say that if R1 goes to zero, then what happens? I equals one half m r squared. <coughs> That's for the solid cylinder. If I want the hollow one, what if r1 goes to equal r2? Right? If I stretch r1 all the way out to it's equal to r2, then they're equal to each other. If r1 squared plus r2 squared doesn't give me two r squared, right? Right. And this will cancel the half. So I'll say if R1 equals R2, then I becomes MR squared. And that's your ring. Oh. Or hollow cylinder, if you want to call it right. Very hollow. Very hollow. Very hollow cylinder. So using this, if I change your limits of integration, technically you can come up with three different models of inertia, right? Right. With one, one uh, derivation, one proof. Okay, the last one we want to look at is what happens if I have linear, back to linear, 
uh, mass density. But what if we have a rod? Okay. So let's look at a rod. And I guess, let's see, is it time to, I, I can still go over here one more time. I don't think we need to move it over to me. How are we doing in that? Oh, it's fine. Our projection is over here. <laughs> our videographer. Yeah. Uh, it's, yeah. Can you still see everything okay? Can I ride over here now? Yeah, you can ride over there. So we're going to do a rod of length L. So here we're going to drive numbers for a rod. This is my rod. which has a link, capital L. And we're going to stick it on the x-axis. So here's my little x-axis. I'm not as good as the guy on the video today, for those of you that were here fifth period today. There's my little x-axis. And here's my y-axis. And I want to spin that rod about the y-axis. There's my little crank. We're, we're going to spin it about the, the y-axis. So here, we're taking the meter stick, or the whatever we want, the rod, or whatever, and we're spinning it around one end, okay? So what we do is we've got to create our little total mass is the total mass of this rod, which we use as capital M. So we're going to set up a differential element of mass here somewhere. So this little be piece here will be a dm, and it will occupy a space of dx. And x will be the distance from the origin. So does that make sense? Hopefully, guys, if I've got this little element of mass here, it's got a thickness of dx, and it's the next distance away from the middle, from the origin over there. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. So here's my origin right here. That's an origin by zero, zero. So how do I apply, or how do I apply the, the theory? Well, the definition is right. It's I equals integral of R squared dm. Well, I got, again, we've got to find an expression for dm. Our key is find an expression for dm. Well, as with Gauss's law, we want to find an expression for dq, right? Charge unit volume of area or, or linear stuff or whatever. We always want to find what dq is. Well, here we want to find out what dm is. So if I've got, a linear mass density again, nice uniform density. I'm going to use it called lambda. So the total mass of my rod, divided by the total length of the rod, is lambda. Well, it's also the same thing as dm over, in this case, we're using dx, because my rod is on the x-axis. So the ratio of dm over dx is the same thing as the whole length over the total mass, or the total mass over the whole total length there. So if I solve this for dm, I get lambda dx. So let's stick in lambda dx r squared times lambda dx. And what are my lines of integration? Well, I got to integrate from 0 to L. Hopefully, hopefully this we're okay. Then I want to pull out my lambda because it's constant. We say it's uniformly spread throughout the whole, whole thing here. So I'll pull out my lambda. And I get r squared. Or in this case, how about we'll put x squared. Because my, my basic image is r squared dm. Here, my r, the radius of that, will be x. So we'll, we'll make this x squared dm. And now that's going to be the integral of what? One third. Well, no, no. What, what is it? x squared dx, right? Oh, right. And then we get what you said. And we're going from 0 to L. So the moment of inertia then becomes lambda, which is the total mass divided by the total length times x cubed over 3. Yeah. I've got away from 0 to L. Yeah. So put the upper limit in there. I get m L cubed over L divided by 3.
well, one else cancels here. So I'm left with this guy goes to the square, this guy goes away. So I'm left with one third and L squared. And that's the moment of inertia for a rod pivoted about the middle. It's, it's center mass. I'm sorry, pivoted about the center. Now, what if I want to put the rod pivoted about the middle? Well, I don't have to redo do the whole problem. Can I just change my axis? I don't do it. Let's do it in blue. Okay. And if I put my blue here, and let's say that. My axis is at the middle. Now, I still have my y. I still got my x. But this little distance x here is going to be right from there to there. And I still got my dm and my dx. But this time, instead of going to integrate from 0 to L, I'm going to integrate from negative L over 2 to positive L over 2. So I'm going to go from negative L over 2 to positive L over 2. Do you see what I'm doing? Yeah. So all I do is change the length of integration. And I get the same thing that I got before. But this time, it's going to be I is equal to integral from negative L over 2 to positive L over 2. And I get the same integral here. So this is going to be lambda x squared dx. So I get lambda times x cubed over 3. And I'm going to evaluate from negative L over 2 positive L over 2. So if I pull out the one third, and my lambda is my total mass, divided by my total length. And then I get x cubed, divided from negative L over 2, positive L over 2. So if I do that, I get L cubed over 8 minus negative L cubed over 8, so it's plus. So I get 1 third, total mass, divided by total 8. And then I get the upper limit would be L over 2, 100 cubed, minus negative L over 2, 1 and here, you can see how we're going to get 1 eighth plus 1 eighth, which is going to be 1 fourth, so I get 1 third, M over L, and I get L what? L cubed over 8. Plus L cubed over 8. That's going to be L cubed over 4. And 1 third. M over L. L cubed over 4. That gives us 1 12. M L squared. Because 1 and L is canceled. This cell down here cancels one of these and makes it a square. So there's my one. Four and three is twelve. Is it one twelve and one square? Now what do you think? One twelve. One twelve. One over twelve. Because four times three is twelve. Let me check my notes. I think that's as far as we. Oh, couple real quick, just equations, but that's what we got for the moment's inertia. So what we derived would be a ring. We derived a cylinder, hollow, solid, whatever, and we, we derived a rod through the middle and to the end. You know, all it was was shifting the, the uh, loads of integration. So the 1 over 12 is like the rod spinning this way? No. No, it's like this. 
Yeah. Oh, oh, right. Okay, got it. Yeah, I know. Here's, here's the rod. Here's the center mass. It's spinning it this way. Okay. About the middle. That's the one. One twelve. And if I take it like this and spin it around this end, that's the one third. It's gonna be bigger than one twelve because you got more mass farther away. Okay. And the last thing that we'll mention is huh? once we did all the kinematics and we did dynamics, right? Then we went to all those special things called momentum and energies, right? Mm -hmm. So the equations that we that we uh, need to get for that are uh, he's he's going to check to see whether we what, what we'll fit it in there. The first one is uh, you know uh, work energy. I think we did that next. The next thing we did so. We said work is equal to change kinetic energy. Well, same thing's going to happen here. We're going to get work equals the change in the kinetic energy rotational. And how do we calculate work? Well, it was SPR, and now it's going to be torque and d theta. It's a shame. Right? Torque d theta. And here, rotational kinetic energy is my one half I omega squared. That would be final, minus one half, I omega squared, initial. This is the work. So the work equals change kinetic energy, just like it did before. But we have, like you can look Greek, so we got work is integral of torque d theta, instead of integral of FDR, right? Instead of FDR, we have torque d theta. Instead of one half mv squared, we have one half i omega squared. What does that say? What kills k e y? Rot. 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 Rotational. Rot. I'm sorry. K e rot. Rotational. Yes. And once we did work energy, we went to momentum. And so instead of having linear momentum, we now have angular momentum. But there's two expressions for angular momentum. We use capital L. It is a vector. One is r cross p. We have what we call a point mass. Okay. Well, R is R, P is MV, so it's R times MV times sine of theta. Again, where that theta is the angle between the, the R vector and the P vector, we put them tail to tail. Well, the other thing for objects is going to be I omega. This is for a uh, rotating object. So an ice skater can have angular momentum. You know, they can, by changing their arms, you're changing their moments of inertia, okay? And then that works. So I omega is for distributions of mass, and R cross P is for point masses. So for point, I, I would call this a point mass. Now, I would call this uh, a body, a big body. Okay. What is L again? L is angular momentum. L is angular momentum. And just like the way Newton's first second law was not really F equals MA, it was F equals DP DT. Hmm. So the force and press is equal to dpdt. Well, the rotation analog for that would be the torque, the external torque, is equal to the rate of change of the angular momentum, the LDT. So we got conservation of momentum if the external force is equal to zero, then P was conserved. Here, if the external torques are equal to zero, then L is conserved. That's the kicker. Right, which I think there on the problem we worked in the class the other day, uh, that's what we, we have said. Okay. So here is if F equals zero, then P had to be a constant. Right? The derivative of the constant is zero. Right? Mm -hmm. And here if torque net equals zero. Then the L has to be a constant. Okay? And that should make a, a nice little complete set. So we did momentum, angular momentum, 
and get the interview work. And that's the, all the chapters we did. Now we did it in Greek. All right. And I think that should be it. Let me just get so everything. Go ahead and stop. Now it's quiz time. Quiz time, thanks. Which, uh, you take, take about five minutes with us. Good. And I'm going to tell you the, uh, the secret before I get, make you sweat. Okay? I made them sweat. And that was, I gave them out the quiz, and they were still working on it. I said, it'll take about five minutes. Well, ten minutes, no one had turned it in yet. Oh. And so I said, I said, I'll, I'll spot you one free, so you, if you get five out of five right, that's 100. Or in other words, five out of six right, that's 100. So you can still miss one and make it.